Bro, what's up? How are you feeling? Doing good, man. Just, you know, the quarantine life, the same answer that we're, we're given probably countless times now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How are you doing? Man, we're, we're doing well. Um, we're doing well. My family's doing well. You know, I got my wife, my two children. And so for them, they think it's, they think it's summer vacation came early. So they're, they're loving it. Um, but simultaneously, right, like we, we're in the thick of it. We're in Queens, Brooklyn, uh, New York. So, man, it is, it's hitting us. It's hitting us so hard. It's yeah. hitting us hard. For those that don't know, from my, from my fan base, uh, yeah, yeah. this is Pastor Chris Durso, lead pastor at St. Church. I love the name, too, bro. Oh, thank you, man. That's just changed it. Yeah. Um, man, you've been doing this for a while. Uh, I feel like I'm going to have a lot of exciting conversations with you because you grew up in church and there's a lot of things I'm going to yeah, tell you yeah. about, me about growing up in church. Um, we have a lot of mutual friends as well. This is how this uh, kind of came organically. And I met you um, a couple of times, but the one time that really stuck with me was at Reach Records that you came uh, to our studio. My next tip. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I learned quickly, I didn't know you, uh, like people say they like hip hop, but like you a real hip hop head though. Like, you know, your stuff, you know, a lot of old school stuff and you know, a lot of present stuff. Yeah. yeah. I'm very impressed because it's rare for a pastor to be in tune with culture like that with hip hop. So sure. man, thank you for joining me on this. Honor, honor, honor. I'm going to take you on a little journey. Okay. So I have an album called Heathen coming out. Yep. Uh, very crazy name, title, uh, scary okay. from the church world, immediately. Okay. Um, and that wasn't my mission, to scare people. Uh, I've just learned that as marketing is going by, I'm like, oh, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of, uh, well, deep conversation that needs to just be peeled back and, and spoken about um, because the way church culture has been designed to be now. And church culture is a beautiful thing. Uh, there's nothing in this conversation I'm going to be saying as far as this is wrong or anything. Uh, I'm not church hurt, bro. <laughs> no way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm a product of church is what I'm trying yeah. to say. And I'm very proud and happy. So, bro, just a little bit about your background. Um, you're a pastor's son, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a PK uh, my whole life. My dad. Uh, my parents started our church. It'll be 36 years uh, this Mother's Day. Okay. Um, and so I grew up in, in that church, which it was formerly known as Christ Tabernacle. Yeah. Uh, we just recently changed the name January 1 of 2020 to Saints Church. Yes. Uh, but I grew up in that church. I mean, our first building was in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, uh, where now we have campuses in Bushwick, Brooklyn, and uh, Glendale, Queens. Yeah, I'm born and raised Queens, New York. Um, and then because we had church in Brooklyn, I was always in Brooklyn. I probably spent equally as much time in Brooklyn as I did Queens. Uh, so, yeah, I think when you make the reference of, oh, you're a pastor, you know, hip hop. Um, yeah, I think with that, just knowing that I grew up in Queens and Brooklyn, I mean, you can't escape hip hop. I mean, it is. I've, I've gotten into fistfights uh, in school because I went to school in Queens and I was the biggest Jay-Z fan. So how could you be a Jay-Z fan? We're from Queens. And so like when the whole beef was happening with him and I, so yeah, like I'm, I, I get it. I understand it. And, um, but yeah, that's my, that's my upbringing. I did youth ministry. Uh, my wife and I for over a decade oversaw our youth young adult ministry. It was called Misfit uh, to where four and a half years ago, we started this transition to become the lead pastors of our church, which we just did at the end of January, which, I mean, this is week 10 for us, by the way. So week 10 of being lead pastors, and here we are in the middle of this pandemic. Yeah, uh, yeah no one prepared me for this one. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, man, it's real. It's real. Yeah. Bro, growing up, did you ever hear the word heathen? Sure. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's such a, ironically, the irony of the word heathen is that I've only used, I've heard it used by Christians but totally understand, totally understand that a Christian would be offended by being associated with one. It was like, well, who, you know, who responds to the altar calls, all the heathens, or who leaves early, or sits in the balcony, you know, all the jokes uh, when you grow up non-denominational, which non-denominational is really low-key Pentecostal. Like when you grow up in that world, it's like, you, you know, you associate anyone that leaves church early or misses yeah. they, they're a heathen, yeah. uh, which is wild because you could have the drug addict or the person that just 
miss the service and they're in the same category they're heathens for uh, sure for sure yeah, yeah. So absolutely i love the name by the way thank you bro i love it too um literally the way it came about was every single album process i start off i just go through my childhood i'm starting a lot of conversations like this with my friends i'm yeah. just talking about life like what matters to us and then direction how we're growing and uh this album process was it struck a lot of me as far as where i've come from like the growth um i've got to explain in some other interviews where my first album we belong was uh pretty much me just new to the to the scene sure and uh just pretty much trying to make everyone happy like hey Christian radio, they like doing this. Make sure you do this kind of Christian radio song. Uh, yeah. Do this for the youth groups and everything. And although I love that album still, um, I, it wasn't fully me. I wasn't happy. I was trying to make everyone else happy, right? Mm -hmm. Then Panorama happened, my second album. And I am doing this rebellious thing because I went through all the green rooms, right? Yeah. And I'm seeing a lot of behind the scenes and I'm traveling a lot, but then I'm also seeing a light side of side of me where I'm like, man, my music actually means a lot to people. I've done me and greets and they're like, yo, Gavi, you know, your, your song changed my life. And I'm like, oh, there's a different weight to this. Right. You know, uh, this album, I'm like, okay, you know who you are. Mm -hmm. You're so confident in the music you're making now. Like, this is you. Um, but yeah, you feel, I feel like I can't um, be fully me because there's a lot of restrictions in that. And I had a really dope conversation with Propaganda where we were talking about how hip hop as just a whole has always been cataracted as something bad, mm -hmm. in a way, right? It's dangerous, mm -hmm. it's grungy, uh, adventurous, right? And when you brought that into the, uh, to the church culture, right, yeah. it was scary. And what Christian hip hop needed to do immediately, the first time Christian hip hop ever was invented, right? It needed to make sure it gave a sound that was safe, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Christian hip hop has grown. I've grown into different breeds, may I say? And um, where I'm at right now is I still feel like there's a tug. And this is where I want to talk to you about. Yeah, yeah, I love uh, it. Church culture. Uh, I remember growing up and I was a PK uh, in the Bronx, New York. Let's go. Yes. Speaking and, of hip hop, by the way. Huh? Speaking of hip hop, you grew up in the Bronx, the birth of Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Know. My dad was part of Assemblies of God in the Latin side. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it just, you know, you know what it is growing up in church. You're there 24 seven. You get bored. You're hitting all the drum sets for no reason because you have nothing else to do. Right. And if you miss Sunday, you're a heathen. Yep. You know, it's a joke, though. Now, yeah. there's a serious aspect to it where, man, I really realized growing up, the only reason why faith became my own when I hit high school for all those years, bro. I just went with the tradition, and this is my story, this is not everyone, but I'm just explaining what's going on. Sure. For years, uh, it was a thing of don't share your secrets. Don't show them your vulnerability because you are the pastor's son. Right. If you show any sign of weakness or you're struggling through something, whoo, boy, you are a sinner and your dad's going to get it, you're going to get it, it's just bad, right? right? Yeah, yeah. And I've kind of seen that in church life where people are really scared. They'll live life to life, uh, day to day. Just everything's great, Brother Peter. Yes, doing good, do doing good. Um, what is it about uh, that fear of being vulnerable and not being accepted? Do you think that is that can carry into people and being called a heathen, you know? Yeah, I mean, first off, this is a fun conversation. Because yeah. I think in order to, if we're, if we're really answering that question, you got to look at church history. And sure. what happened is the, the moment, so you mentioned the Assemblies of God, shout out to the Assemblies of God, both Assemblies, Spanish Assemblies, I love them, all my people. And again, um, I don't have all the answers. These are, and there's so much layers and complexity. 
th this is what I'm saying. So like I grew up in a, in a church. We were in Assemblies of God, but very similar. Uh -huh. And what happens is in church, especially Christian, especially the 80s and the 90s when the charismatic church kind of, you know, erupted. Yeah. Everyone got so caught up on this idea. This is my own two cents on it, by the way. Everyone got so caught up on this idea of revelation. So what am I, not the book of Revelation, even though that's a great book, but what nuances in the text can I preach from? Yeah. And what happens is people start going Old Testament. And now all of a sudden, the deeper your text was or the deeper your thought was, the further you must have been along in your Christianity or the closer to God. Right. And here's what that does. That leads us on a track away from testimony. I was lost, but now I'm found. Because now that just seems like the milk, for lack of a better term. That seems like the baby food. Mm. And I think what happens is when you start moving away from this idea of grace, I'm a sinner saved by grace. It is what it is. I was lost, but I'm not found it. My, yeah. my righteousness is like filthy rags, right? All the things that the Bible points out to us so blatantly. When you move away from that, and yeah. you now start moving into all these other ideas that now all of a sudden make me a better Christian pastor believer. Yeah. The idea that I would be associated with something that wasn't this untouchable man of God. I mean, that, uh, there was a point in time in Christianity where like you couldn't look a man of God in the eyes. It was almost like you had a bow. And, there were, and what happened was because the pendulum swung such the other way. Mm. And then we're now years past that. And we're like, man, that's weird. That's not, first of all, that's not the Bible. Yeah. Second, so many of these so-called men of God, which is heartbreaking, either lost mm. their ministry, made a mistake. Yeah. The very things that they said would never happen happened to them. Yeah. And they're going, hey, there's a, there's a crack in the system. That's not necessarily true. Yeah. And this is where it has been. So, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I love the name heathen. I love keeping, I love keeping the negative side of it all, which it's not negative. It's honest, but church would identify it as negative. I love keeping it in the forefront because it reminds all of us that none of us are taller than the other spiritually. Like we're all the same height at the foot of the cross. Yeah. So because we all operate from this place, Man, I'm, I, all I am by myself is filthy, messed up, jacked up, heathen. I'm right. talking to the guy that, you know, loves the word misfit, wrote a book called Misfit, wrote a book called The Heist. I love the idea of focusing yeah. the attention on the negative. I identify more with this than I do with that. So, yeah, let's stay there. Uh, um, the thing that I've loved about your story that I keep up with is your boldness um and every single aspect so layers of how you dress how you communicate how you have uh just led your church as far as aesthetics how it looks right uh the branding everything there's so much detail to how you move that i really uh just admire and i wanted to know from you um even there's two questions in one then actually Church culture is so different now because now we're doing live stream, right? We can't go yeah, to yeah. Uh, everything is changing. What has been so comforting for you? It, 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 to, in my eyes, it seems like you have a smooth transition of knowing how to address church culture now today, whether it's the way you dress, the way you communicate, uh, visuals, um, and then even live stream. Like, what is it that you've, you've caught on? about church culture that you know, hey, this is a shift. Yeah, so again, thank you for saying all that, super kind. Um, I, I think that culture in general, so I just, I, I am a student of culture, born and raised by the culture, live, you know, born and raised in New York. Yeah. Um, the thing that we've watched with culture, whether it was an album release, or whether it was a music video, or even how music videos were being done, or even the entertainment, that catches the next generation. It's like the more stripped down it becomes, the more appreciated it is. And this is what happens constantly in culture, right? Like you go from one to the next. It's like baggy jeans, skinny jeans. Now we're back to baggy. I mean, you take that same principle, and I think right now everything is stripped down. And I think the reason why in Christian culture it's so important for things to be stripped down is because, like we were kind of already alluded to, there was an era where it was piled on so thick and it was very difficult to find out, well, what is authentic and what is man-made? What is, what is the Bible actually telling us to do? And what are we just adding on because it's either preference or, or we think this is what we're supposed to be doing? So I think right now, 
we're in the middle of a pandemic. That's a really big word, by the way. That's not a word used lightly. Yeah. It's yeah. not a word that we've ever really used like this in yeah. our lifetime, if we're being honest, right? So right. like, if, if, if you're leading your family, if I'm leading my family through a fire, let's say our house is on fire, what they don't want is some nice, polished, politically correct direction from dad. They want to know how to get out and how are we going to get saved. Right yeah. now, all anybody wants is honesty. That's all they want. Yeah. So yeah. you know, for me, um, and from my perspective as a pastor, I don't know what to do. That, I believe, is far more respected than me yeah. trying to get up and say, well, I knew yeah. this was going to happen, and I prophesied, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, if you did, then why are we here right now? Um, pe people, people love authenticity. I mean, not to date myself. You know, I'm 36 years old. But, like, one of the statements I grew up hearing and still love, by the way, is real recognize real. And I think growing up in New York, doing church in an urban setting like we do it, all yeah. they want is honesty. That's all they want. Just, just tell me yeah. what to do. Tell me what it is, and I can rock with you. I could, I could follow you because I know you're being honest. Has that honesty ever given you any pushback? Sure. Oh man, yeah. I mean, story of my life. Um, yeah. So here, here's a quick example, but fun. Um, you know, we when we were for the past four years working with a coach from Patrick Lencioni, famous business leader. And he has a group called the Table Group. It's about six coaches. And they, they volunteered, biggest blessing to us, by the way, to mm -hmm. walk my dad, my wife, my mom and I through this transition. Mm -hmm. And as he started working with my team, as he started working with, with our church, he started to tell us things like, hey, as long as you're honest, we don't care how you get the honesty. And I remember like looking around because I was like, wait, for real? Because I know how to be honest. If there's one thing I know how to do, I have a bad poker face. I'm not good at lying, but I could be honest. I know how to be honest. And when he said it, my wife and I both looked at each other and we felt like we could breathe because so often people take honesty as offense. Mm -hmm. but, but the only reason why honesty is offensive is too. I mean, you got to be mindful of your tone and the inflection of your voice when you say something. Absolutely. Sure. For but, sure. But I'd rather, I'd rather an offensive tone than the truth, than a kind tone and it not being genuine. Yes. And this is, and I remember that moment, by the way, I remember that moment looking at my wife and her looking at me like this whole time we thought something was wrong with us because we would just say it as it is. And yep. we were offended by that. Like, hey, the carpet's ugly or this isn't a good song or this is not the direction. I don't know why we should be doing X, Y, and Z. And people are like, how could you say that? We've had, you know, maroon, maroon, uh, carpet for 20 years. It's God. Like it's no, it's old and it's dingy. We need to get the heck, we need to get rid of it. You know what I mean? So like, yeah, it's, it's definitely hurt me. Um, I do think though that when someone is honest, but trust isn't established, that's a very difficult thing to take place. You have to build the trust before you give the honesty. Sure. You know, it's one thing for my wife to tell me, hey, Chris, you're gaining weight. Those, those jeans don't look good on you. It's good another job. thing for a complete stranger to walk up to me and go, hey, man, those jeans don't look good on you. You look like you gained weight. Right. You'd be like, whoa, because I don't have a relationship. So a relationship matters so much, by the way, when it comes to honesty. I think that's our, uh, when, you, when you come to know Jesus for the first time, I've realized this, is, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. What I did was I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so in love with God, I need to go out and tell everyone about Jesus. And you go into the plazas and stuff, and you're like, hey, yeah. you need Jesus. Hey, yeah. hey, let me tell you about Jesus, bum, 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 bum. And it's perfect with that example. It's, I, I don't think Christians do it on purpose to be mean. I think it's lack of direction at times where uh, it could feel judgmental because of what you just said, right? I don't know you, we don't have a relationship, and you're about to tell me about my whole entire life? What, wait, whoa, chill. Right. But then if we had built a relationship and love is introduced, then it's like, yo, gee, uh, those jeans, I don't know, they kind of tight on you right now, dog. You know? Then it's like, oh, for real? Oh. Right. Yo, thank you, right? Um, and that's a, that's a great example, man. Uh, I'm really excited to dive into this next section with you where you're a pastor. You're way smarter than me. Uh, <laughs> that is not true. Yeah. So I wanted to break down this word heathen. Okay. Right. So 
first I hear the word and then I go Christian culture, what its standards has been and what we have discussed, right? Uh, it's a playful, negative word. Mm -hmm. Then I look at Google, I'm like, Google, what is heathen? And it's someone that is not held to a widely held religion, right? So I'm like, okay, well, what's the Bible say? And then I'm like, well, it's not in the Bible. Oh, wait, it is. It's in King James, right? And then I'm looking at it. I'm like, why is it only in King James? This is pretty interesting. And then what's the actual difference? Oh, it's Gentiles in the other scriptures. Okay, well, what's the root of this word? Right? I'm just going down the rabbit, rabbit trail. Yeah. And then I'm seeing that it's ethos in Greek. And it's, it's the way it's in different contexts. It's either used as ethnicity or a Gentile or someone that's just playing out. They're talking about sinner, right? Um, did I do a good job in that? Or have I just lost people astray in this word of heathen, in your opinion? No, I think, I think the word heathen is the, <laughs> is the right word to use. I think, that, I think that we all need to identify as heathens more than we identify as anything else. I mean... The idea that I'm holy equally, I should be able to identify myself as holy and heathen. They're like, well, that's a that's a double entendre, you know, that's negative, and it's it's not because if if there was something that I could do on my own that makes me holy, then yeah, don't call me heathen. But because the only reason I'm holy is because of the grace of God, then that points out to wait a minute it has nothing anything to do with something that I could have done, but predicated solely and only on God. Mm. Oh man, you are a heathen saved by grace. You are a heathen made holy. You are you were once lost, but now you're found, and you're only found because God accepted you, not because you completed the ten steps of Christianity. Now, I think the word heathen heathen is beautiful. I, I, I was just talking with someone earlier today, and I was talking about uh, Judas and how so many people get so appalled by Judas. And as if, oh, Judas is the epitome of sinner and he is the epitome of the villain, as if none of us have Judas moments. And in fact, I think if we were to look at our resumes or our life, man, we have more Judas moments than we do any other disciples moments. And I think the moment you start to be honest with yourself and you're honest about who you are, how flawed you are how finite your thinking is. This is why Romans, by the way, tells us to renew our mind daily because naturally we have a propensity to think like a heathen, to behave like a heathen. So if, if I have to do that daily, that's just, that's how close it is to who I can be on my own, by the way. Mm -hmm. I know I'm saved. I know I'm delivered. I know that I'm not going to be treated as my sins deserve. But again, it's because he chooses not to treat me that way. Not yeah. that I've accomplished anything. No, I think all day we need to we need to be identifying as heathens. To be honest with you, I, I think I need to be the first one to say that I've been a heathen and I have heathen moments. I have Judas moments. There are many times where I've sinned. What does sin mean? Missing the mark. There have been how how often do we miss marks? By the way, it's just it's just really a matter of how do I identify the word, which is the brilliance, by the way, of you defining it and breaking it down and crystallizing it where we don't have to think it's this far off thing. It's, it's yeah. not heathen as someone that misses the mark. Well, it is. Right. Why do you think, I feel like I have to, uh, exp I feel like a broken record at times. Okay. Uh, I have to explain myself a lot to our, um, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying every fan is like this but there's a loud 5% that's really loud. That seems like all fans, but it's not, right? Yeah, I love them. We all, yeah, we all have them, yep. Right? Uh, there's a tendency that I feel like I have to continuously educate and say, no, I'm not championing saying, let's all be sinning, yes, right? This is not your identity, right. but these are the reality. The reality is that this is our actions. We are human beings that, we have been, we do, we do this daily, right? right. Um, why do you think in Christian culture there is that loud 5% that's really loud, really, 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 really loud, <laughs> uh, yeah. that you feel like um, sometimes we just have to continuously have grace and explain and explain? And should I, or is this you going to tell me, bro, don't even explain no more? 
No, because I'm, I'm the guy, by the way, that my wife has to grab my phone at times and say, why are you responding? You know, I could post something and get a whole lot of people that say nice things. And that one person that wants to drive some idea home where I feel like they're completely off, I'm trying to explain it to them. But the thing I've learned with them, whether I go one-on-one in the comment section, go in the DM, whatever, I try to, I'm not going to get them. And the reason why it's so hard to get someone like that, by the way, is because they're self-righteous and self-righteous people see themselves as completely justified. And you're saying that I'm this, I've never done that. But really the only reason why someone would be self-righteous is because they're unaware. They're unaware of how they sin. They're unaware of how flawed they are. They're Mm -hmm. unaware of their mistakes. I mean, you've all heard the, we've all heard that statement, you know, don't judge me because I sin differently than you. And I don't mind that statement because it's true. We all sin different. Like, yeah, you could, you could say you're not the same as that person because that person is addicted to X, Y, and Z. But what you are addicted to is your self-righteousness. And to God, it's all ugly. Um, I get those people, by the way, often. Um, I do find myself trying to, trying to talk with them. It, it does feel really difficult. It does feel really tiring. Um, but I'm also the guy that could be so dogmatic in my thinking at times where, where one conversation shifted things for me. And I realized, man, I was blind. I was, I was so hung up on this idea. And then think of the fact that, well, God loves all people, even those 5%, which I got to admit, I find very difficult to, to tolerate at times. I've learned to call them my cousins. <laughs> that, that's good. Every time I deal with them, I'm like, yo, you Gabby's cousin. That's what I'm, I'm referring to them from now on. You ever had that cousin in your family that you're just at the dinner table and you're like, man, I love you, but why are you talking about this right now, bro? Right. Yeah, no EQ. Well, no. on something else. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I know that guy. I feel like I don't hate these people because I love them. Uh, but I'm like, yo, y'all sounding like a cousin of mine that's just like, like why, yeah, well, why did you why did you show up to the concert? Why did you jump on the page? If you do not like me, unfollow. You know what I mean? Like, why yeah. do you think we're gonna do this right here? And yet there's something inside of them that thinks, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna show them. But yeah, that's your cousin. Bro, you seem like you have found, um, this is what I'm receiving, you and the way you move too, you seem like you have found peace uh, with this loud 5%. Hmm. And for me, I, I've learned that I've struggled uh, in this process of, I'm always like, why am I kept in a box? And I struggle in my mind. I'm like, I have to write back to every single comment. I need to. Uh, when it's like, my wife calms me down as well. And she's like, babe, stop. It really does not matter for you to waste your energy right now on that. There's way more of an importance of a mission that you have. And right now, you need to focus on me. <laughs> you chilling with me right now. Right? right? Yeah, don't rob me of my family time. She's right, by the way. Yeah, sometimes it could consume my mind and it sucks. I'm just wondering, like, how do you come with peace? Do you have peace with that? Like, or does do those things still bother you? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, if my wife were here right now, she'd be just nodding her head looking like this because it, it does bother me. I think, though, that even if I win that person over and it took five hours, was it worth the five hours that it took me away from my family? Mm-hmm. Uh, my family is my responsibility. My church is my responsibility. I mean, I know we live in a world where, you know, people – love guest speakers or love authors or love what rappers and musicians and like you know especially you know the world in general right now has made celebrity out of so many so many different types of subcultures and yep. there's this tendency to feel like we're responsible for them but the truth is the bible calls me the word of god calls me to be a steward and the only thing i could steward is what is in my hand so the only thing that's in my hand for chris dersa is, is Jairus, my wife Mm-hmm. Dylan and Chloe, my children, Sense Church, and then my actual friends. Nothing else. I can't, I can't do well with it because it's not in my hand. And yeah. I'm not going to be accountable for, you know, Jesus lover, prophetess 24-7 on Instagram that, you know, has some fake idea. I'm not, I'm not accountable for that person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you, you, they always got the wild names, by the way. Um, you know, like, and I'm not accountable for that person. Um, I don't want to lead them astray. I don't want to cause them to stumble. So what I do is, man, I just bless them. 
man, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Pray you have a good day. And they can't understand that because they're so used to getting yeah. response or just don't respond. Yeah. Have you ever noticed that a bee doesn't sting people that it's not that where it's not being swatted at? Bees only sting when you give it attention, right? Okay. I mean, so if I ignore it, I'm not gonna feel the sting. And I think it's worth it for both of us. That's good, yo. See, you pastor, you natural at this. That I didn't get that, you know. My dad was a pastor, but you know, I went to Bible college for two semesters. Where at? Uh, at Southeastern University. Let's go. I love Southeastern. And uh, I thought I was going to be a youth pastor, and quickly I knew that was not my calling. <laughs> we need cool, awesome youth pastors. Yeah, the world has plenty of those. I don't need to fill in those shoes, <laughs> man. There's enough of those. Uh, man, where is church culture going? Yeah, so I think uh, that, that's a beautiful conversation, right? Because before this, I would not have put the amount of attention that we would have liked to into the internet and virtual church. The mm -hmm. silver lining, the silver lining in this horrible situation is that it has forced us to focus on virtual church. And we're being honest, I'm seeing just the church growth, not the amount of people that click on and off, but if I, yeah. if I can look at unique streams on services and people that are staying for the whole hour and 20 minute service that we're putting online, I mean, I'm seeing growth that would have been impossible wow. because of the size of our building. You know, our building, we do four services on Sunday. It maxes out at 850 legally, 1,000 illegally. And, you know, it's New York, so we, we break fire codes. But even still, virtually, yeah. We're able to reach way more people in the, the amount of people that are engaging. Um, so to be honest with you, the virtual church becomes very important, equally as important as a main campus. Um, we just have to figure a way how to pass the people, you know, through that. So, you know, for us, we're offering things like um, prayer one-on-one -on -one and counseling one-on-one -on -one and discipleship mm -hmm. and small groups and all the things that we would do normally you know, at Saints Church in Queens, we're now doing it through the internet and it's working by the way. I mean, That's dope. it's been adapted pretty well. So all, all 20 something of my staff members are now engaging in virtual church and none of their previous job descriptions or titles even mattered anymore because you can't get to it. So mm -hmm. now the focus is this and the impact and the testimonies and the stories. And it's beyond New York. I mean, it's the States, it's Africa, it's Asia, it's yeah. Australia, New Zealand. So we're seeing it come from all over. I'm like, man, this is the future. Okay. I got, I, I want to, I want, I want to disciple them. I want to reach them. I want to love on them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in Christianity, there is a lot of um, different genres, right? I'm, I'm thinking music right now. Yeah, right. Um, I think about church too. There's different genres right? Uh, different way that people view things. And what I'm thinking through is, um, how do I say this? How important do you think, or is it not important at all? But there is a lot of pastors that have great relationships with a lot of celebrities, right? Yep. And how important is it that people that are in the forefront of Christian culture, whether you're an artist, music producer, pastor, whatever it may be, do you think it's important that we're connecting with celebrities? What's your, your idea on that? Um, I'm laughing because this is such a dumb question. <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a good question. I think it's a good question. No, but it's good because I know, it's, I know it's leading into some more than what we're about to talk into. Go. Yeah, so here's what I would say. I mean, obviously, celebrities are people. Our goal is to reach people, uh, yeah. rich or poor, famous or not famous. You know, the Bible doesn't say that it's impossible to reach lost people. It just says, I mean, rich people or famous people. It just says it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. But I love the idea that what well, even difficulty could be accomplished because yeah. if someone gets saved and now their sphere of influence is now turned towards Jesus and now all that attention that they were getting and now they could use it as a soundboard or as an arrow towards Jesus, man, that's a win. I think, I think the tension, the tension, by the way, is because we have such a celebrity driven world, 
reality te television shows and celebrities aren't just sticking to their sandbox anymore. They're acting, they're rapping, they're designing sneakers, they're, they're doing all these things. And now all of a sudden we look at them and we're like, you know, like, oh, they, you know, they can never identify. But the truth is they could identify, maybe not from a financial space, but from yeah. a spiritual space. So yeah. if I could reach them and I could love on them, man, that's a win. Which side note, by the way, um, I find it that it is typically uh, the older demographic of Christians that have an issue with celebrities being reached. However, I've been a part of too many prayer meetings growing up, and I've been in too many conferences where I've heard those older pastors pray for Hollywood to be saved. And just yeah. because the prayers yeah. that you prayed are now being answered and doesn't include you does not mean that you get to miss it. In fact, I think you should celebrate. I think they should celebrate, even though I'm sure they're not gonna watch this, but they should be celebrating because their prayers are being answered because they did pray for Hollywood to be saved and for yeah. rappers yeah. and actors and actresses to be saved. And now they are getting saved. Man, what a beautiful thing. Yeah. Secondly, because of COVID-19 and quarantine, I think the world is realizing very quickly that celebrities don't have the answers because they're stuck at home like we are. Yeah, and yeah. their home might be prettier, but they're still stuck there and yeah. they don't have no VIP pass out of COVID-19. So it's amazing because the world has put in celebrity on such a pedestal and yet now it seems to be diminishing as well. Um, and it's just evening the playing field, but I, I think it's all beautiful. So what you're saying is, Christo, so is <laughs> <laughs> we're supposed to be impacting people right oh okay and then it's important to be impacting culture at the same time too because that's part of hollywood and everything that's culture right there's no way you could we could live life with not being part of culture in some way right I mean, we're all we're all a part of culture we're all the product of culture whether you want to say that you can say well i'm in the world i'm not of the world great but right let's, um remember the scene if you ever watched the devil wears prada and remember when, um, uh, you ever see the movie? It's a brilliant movie, by the way, you, you should totally watch it. I actually never have. Well, yeah, I mean, you're married. Anyway, um, I'm married, I watch it with my wife. There's a brilliant scene in the movie where this intern or this now new receptionist who thinks she's like above fashion, she's going to school for something else, brilliant girl, and okay. she thinks that the fashion world is shallow. And mm -hmm. she walks in and Meryl Streep uh, basically blows her up, says, hey, that sweater you're wearing, you think that you picked that blue on your own and you don't realize, and then she gives her the history of the blue that is on her sweater was actually picked by the people in this room. You just didn't realize it. And I would say that's every pastor that's wearing a suit, every pastor or Christian that's driving a certain car, somebody influenced them to either drive the car, live where they live, listen to the music that they listen to. So you could act like you're not a part of it, but just because you say you're not a part of it doesn't dismiss the fact that you very are much a part of it. Yes. I'm not going to allow what the culture believes about eternity to seep inside, but it would be stupid and silly of me to suggest that I'm not impacted by culture. I'm, I'm very much impacted by culture, but we all are, by the way. Yeah. And I just find it ironic that you are a hip hop artist and the people that are going to be listening to this uh, love your music, love hip hop, love rap. And yet there are still those Christians that think they're not impacted by culture. You are impacted by culture because... Right. This right here, even though you and Reach crush everything you guys do, thank you. We all would agree that Reach Records did not stop hip hop, uh, start hip hop. Excuse me. They right. elevated, they changed it, they curtailed it. But even that is an influence of culture. For sure. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's too much pride, to be honest with you, for people to think that that, that they're not impacted by it. There's there's a scary place uh, that this word gets thrown around, where there's a lot of truth with it, but there's uh, a lot of just fear mostly that I hear in context is you're, you, you sound more worldly now. That sound that looks a little bit, uh, you know, secular. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And it's because it's not familiar to them. Right. It's different. So it's not safe to them when something's not familiar, it's not safe anymore. Right. And you said it really good with the whole, the blue suit thing and stuff like that. It's like, well, you got inspired from somewhere with that. Obviously, culture does connect in every single aspect. Obviously, speaking to a celebrity 
is important at the same time because they're just a human being and they're part of culture. You live in this world. We're going to run into all these things, no matter if you try to shelter yourself inside a house or not. Yeah. You're going to be influenced by something. And um, I think one of, the, one of the coolest heathen stories for me is Paul, mm -hmm. right? Where he comes from, his background. Mm -hmm. Life gets radically changed. Yeah. yeah, even the 12 disciples still question him at times. It's like, what are you? You made sure I'm saying that you a heathen, bro. I don't know, <laughs> you know? And when I connect that in today's culture, I think about Kanye. I'm like, yeah, great. just me as a hip hop person, one of my heroes, right? I can't even say that word. Uh, I got bashed by one of the, my cousins before for saying a hero. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's a hero. He's, he's, he's changed. Yeah. Way you listen to things sonically, musically. I mean, yeah. For sure. But, man, you see how his life was and then his journey and his path. Um, the world had labeled him as a heathen. But now, still, there's a thing where it's like Christian culture. Not everyone, but a few loud 5% is like, well, I don't know. Sure. We'll see how long, how long this lasts. Right. Right? And I just, my biggest desire throughout this whole conversation is people see this. Uh, one, we are all complex people. Sure. We are all broken people. No one is superior over anybody, right? right. So that whole self-righteous talk, I just, it irks me. And it's like, hey, many pastors have talked about this for years. Your friends have talked about this for years. People in my, my own group of music industry, I've talked about this for years. So I'm not, I'm not pioneering anything. I'm just joining in on the conversation and I want the conversation to continue going. Hey, how do we redirect ourselves and how we fix our eyes on Jesus, right? But see that there's a reality of culture that impacts us in how we move day to day, right? And it could affect us, right? There's a point in me, bro, that it was scary because of the way church, church culture can be at times. It made me really feel like I don't want to go to church anymore. Sure. I'm tired of it. Or it would be like, man, this is the same crap over and over. You're about to do announcements. I get it. Bring in the piano now. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. And I think that's just really negative energy. And it goes into these conversations. And when people share around these negative energy where I'm like, man, their Christianity could be so much bigger than the box that people have placed it to be. Right. It used to be the leading art form. You're right. talking about uh, Michelangelo. You're talking about yeah. all Christian culture was so artistic. And now I feel like it's very scary to be in the forefront. Keep it safe. And I just love people like you, man. Uh, I'm just joining in. I'm no, I'm no Malcolm X. I keep on saying I'm not, yeah. I'm not starting anything new. But I really want, I hope that people see these conversations and start just okay, I see that there's a different lens that I haven't seen yet, you know? And I'm not saying I have all the answers again, but man, I love these conversations. I'm learning a lot from you right now, even too, of how, what does church look like? Where is it going? Uh, and yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, can I, there are two things that just come to my mind. Two, um, two. Um, I love music. I've always loved music. I love Christian music. I love worship. I love hip hop. Yes. I love musicians. I love producers. The thing that worries me is that the musicians in the Christian world Let's go. They become very cynical of church because they know how to predict everything that can and would happen. And my argument to them would be if somebody did something completely different flip the script. You might even have an issue with that. It's not so much that the program is the same. The issue is that the heart isn't in the right place. So when you think of the fact that Wednesday before uh, Good Friday is considered Spy Wednesday. So if you go in your Bible, Spy Wednesday, that is the day that the Pharisees, the Pharisees um, plotted to right, get, um, get Jesus arrested Yep. and trick him, and Judas agrees to betraying him. Yeah. The moment 
where Judas agrees to betraying Jesus is the moment where Mary is pouring the perfume on Jesus' feet. Now, here's the part that I would, I would use to make my point. You have Mary that is taking her hair, pouring the perfume, and now we have songs, Alabaster Box, which if you grew up Spanish Assembly of God, I know you know that song. And you have the Alabaster Box. This is that famous moment. And now if you were to ask a Christian that loves Jesus, they might be thinking, oh my goodness, it would be incredible to be in a moment like this one. But think about it. Judas is also in the room. And instead of appreciating the moment for what it is, he's using it as an opportunity to trick Jesus, hand Jesus over to the Pharisees because his mind was not in the right place. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so he is. My push to anyone that has been around church culture, especially musicians, is that when they step into services, is that they would check their own heart because they're right. They could predict what's going to happen. They could predict the worship and the sermon and all. But if you come to the table with the wrong heart, you're no different from the very person you're bothered by. And I think the thing with Christianity for all the people that are going to be watching is that when we come to the table, let's check all of our hearts. The one that just got here, the one that's been here. Because what's the point of having a moment to talk Christianese for a second where I was on fire for God and I lost the fire? Well, the only reason a fire goes out is because you didn't treat it. It's not the fire's fault that the fire went out. And I would say that to, to all of us that are in this conversation, myself included, this is why, by the way, now I'm going to swing it all the way back to heathen. The reason why the word heathen is such a beautiful word uh, for the sake of this conversation is because when I realize I'm not the expert Christian and I am more than the person that has been in a thousand church services, but I am a heathen saved by grace, the very fact of the matter is any moment that I get to be in the presence of God or around other like-minded believers is a beautiful opportunity for God to show up. And that is something to be marveled at. That is something to be encouraged by. That is something uh, to, be, to be received. So like that is honestly where my, where my mind goes. Yes. I would equally say though, like now flipping it, when we talk about how we do church and how church is done, I would say, man, there's so many of the old things that we need to keep. And there's so many of the old things that we need That's to throw away. Right. Right. For me, if, I, if I'm there, there are so many times I'm in moments and I'm worshiping God. I'm going to go to, you could ask my team, I'm going to go to like one of three songs. Um, either I Surrender, Amazing Grace, or Alpha and Omega. If I go to Alpha and Omega, Israel happened, right? You are Alpha and Omega. I would try to sing it if I could. Yeah. Yeah, I can see, I mean, my goodness, my mind just goes. It just, my, I just start worshiping. <laughs> That's me, ugly cry, all of it. Ugly my, cry. Yes, yes. sobbing. And, but, but the <laughs> truth is, it's not, that, it's not that that song is amazing. For me, it's a connection to that song and what that song means and why it has the impact. We don't need to throw out those songs. We need those songs. At the same time, I can't just build my church singing those songs. I want to keep writing new songs. Well, why do we need new songs? Because as any song encapsulates the greatness and the beauty of God, not one has. So let's keep trying. Our God, our God is worthy of every song to be written towards him. How many songs are written on the idea of love? How many songs now are actually written about true love? True mm -hmm. love is God. If you think about it from that standpoint, all songs are based around the idea of love. And yet, worship in Christianity is such a small subculture amongst all songs written. All songs should be written about God. We're not there yet, so we keep writing new songs. But I need the old songs that were written. I need the new songs that were written. And every time we come to the table, we're all heathens, and we realize we don't deserve to be here. But God is so good that he allows me to be in his presence. Man, that's it. So you can just mute everything I said, and we'll just keep Chris Durso's words, and that'll be this whole video then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just love it. Like when you reached out and you were like, "You want to do this?" I'm like, "Yeah," especially when you told me told me the album name. I'm not gonna lie; I thought like I was gonna get like an advanced copy. I didn't get that, so I only got. You get it? I sent it. You didn't get. Nah, you, didn't, you didn't send it. You lying? You didn't. You didn't send oh, it. Man. Uh, I'm not to, it's okay, it's okay. I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for I have it. to talk to the team about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm ready <laughs> to reach. Where's Lecrae? I'm... Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Bro, thank you so much for doing this. You have no idea what this means to me. Uh, you're a legendary pastor. 
in our space. A lot of people respect you and the fact that you would spend some time with me and just talk about Christian culture and just a bunch of stuff with me. I really appreciate it, bro, a lot. Like, you have no idea. And I I'm, think this is going to be fire. I think I'm people are going to be really encouraged. I'm excited for the album. I'm excited for anything that you do. Personally, I'm a fan. And I just, I love you. I love Reach. I love everything you guys are a part of. Um, I, I don't want to be considered a legend yet, though. I'm too, I'm too young to be a legend. You know, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really too young to be feeling this old. Um, Isn't that the old thing? Justin Bieber, young, that's how he's a legend. Yeah, but that's different. I need, I need, a, I need a, that's another conversation. <laughs> Love you, bro, man. Thank you again, y'all. Yes, sir.